With physicality comes the physiological, and no other endeavor puts the human body to the test quite like MMA. But beyond the bones and muscle lie the building blocks of life. And one Cal State Fullerton professor is finding some interesting things about the DNA of a fighter. I'm a professor of human performance and muscle physiology at the Center for Sport Performance in California State University, Fullerton. So my role is to test these guys in methods that they can't do outside of our lab setting. 90 degree angle and let it flop down to there. Today we're going to take them through a full gamut of testing. We're going to look at their vertical jump performance, we're going to look at their other aspects of their power. So what we're going to have him do is pull up on that bar as hard and as fast as he possibly can. And Go, 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 We'll know how much force he actually produces in the ground. And more importantly, we'll know how fast he produces that force. We know in like a sport of MMA, being strong is important. But you've only got a limited amount of time to actually implement that force. Once I started understanding MMA a little bit more, I became really curious in the actual physiology behind it, because it doesn't fit anywhere in our normal spectrum of anaerobic, power sports, or aerobic endurance sports. So now we want to put Tom through a test of his anaerobic power. This is standard to a typical wind gate test, but we're going to actually tweak it a little bit to make it much more specific to what actually Tom does in his MMA fights. Come on, keep driving, keep driving, keep driving, keep, keep, keep driving, keep driving, keep driving. And time, OK. Another test we like to do here is actually a measure of grip strength. This is particularly important for somebody like Pat, who likes to use a lot of grappling in his fighting. Good. And excellent. So that's going to give us a feedback. I don't know if I should show you this or not. This is not his best performance. At the end of that, we're actually going to go in and take a muscle biopsy so we can pull out the muscle and start to analyze it at the single fiber level. Reach in with the right tweezer and just simply pull out fibers one by one. You can see that's one individual fiber right there. What we're looking at here is the actual distribution of their muscle fiber type. So each one of these black dots is a lane, which represents an individual one of their muscle fibers. So now we simply have to count how many of these fast fibers they have versus how many slow, and how many of them are in this hybrid form. What we're actually seeing in our lab is that there's something different at the level of the DNA, at the level of the individual cell with these fighters. Something at the cellular level differentiates them from elite football players, basketball players, or anything else. So what we're trying to do is explore that and figure out how are they doing these things that we thought couldn't be done. You Straight do from the lab to the studio, we welcome in Dr. Andy Galpin. Welcome to Inside MMA. Thanks, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been a longtime fan. Oh, Yay. We appreciate that. We're you talking know, about it in the back. This yeah. is a fascinating study that you guys are doing. Uh, you see you going in and checking out the DNA and the fibers of these fighters. So how does the DNA of a mixed martial artist differ from other athletes or, or just from other people? Well, we actually had no idea this was happening until we started looking. So we started taking biopsies of these UFC fighters and other MMA fighters and started realizing something's different about their muscle. So as an example, every individual human muscle fiber, like you saw in the image there, has thousands of nuclei. The nuclei are what control the cell and what hold the DNA. And so I originally started with this question when I started thinking, how is it that these MMA fighters can recover so well from all the training that they're doing? Right. Well, that recovery and the adaptability and the recovery of a muscle cell comes from the nucleus. So when we started taking a look at some of these athletes, we started seeing, wow, they've got more nuclei. They've got different nuclei. They're in different portions of the cell. And so we started literally thinking, you guys have seen that T-shirt, fighting's in my DNA, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's we were true. like, oh my gosh, we're it's seeing true. something is different about the out. way they regulate their muscle, the way mm. they recover, the way they train again, perhaps the way they're able to, um, to grow and adapt. Is, it's different from them from any other non-athlete and from any other high-level athlete that we've ever seen before. Maybe, uh, maybe adrenaline junkies try to find those guys with like skateboarders or something, crazy stuff, maybe that's the same. I had a question about uh, the fast twitch and the slow twitch fibers, yeah. because I always thought that right. the fast twitch fibers, if you have explosiveness, that you take burn way more and that you need way more oxygen than slow twitch. But mm -hmm. you say that's not the case. Some people have both even, right? No, we, we used to think the same thing, actually. So the way that it works is all of your muscle 
for the most part, is split. It has some portion of one muscle is a little bit fast and some portion of it is slow. Some people have a higher percentage of fast in that muscle, some have a higher percentage of slow. Traditionally, we think that people that have a higher percentage of fast are more explosive and get tired quicker, as you mentioned. Yep. What we're actually seeing with these UFC fighters is that's not true. Yep. Uh, take Patrick Cummins, perfect example, and he's the one that's actually jumped out at me. He is a conditioning type of guy. He's an endurance type of guy. He's a grinding wrestler, right? Known to never get tired. He's huge on the fast twitch spectrum. He's way higher, in fact, than almost anybody we've ever seen. And this is actually when it first jumped out to me. We just started thinking, like, this is not making sense. Yep. Wow. Something is mm. different physiologically about these elite level MMA fighters that we didn't really appreciate scientifically. Yep. Andy, at the end of the day, what is the ultimate goal of this research study and what are some of the next steps? Yeah, so it's really twofold. Number one, I work in the Center for Sport Performance. So we wanna do research that helps sport performance. So first and foremost, I wanna give these guys and girls any information I can to actually help their performance. So trying to keep them as healthy as humanly possible, reduce the injury stuff, and maximize their performance. It works out conveniently for me because I'm all also interested in actually learning more about human physiology. And as we kind of mentioned earlier, we're finding things about them we've never seen in any other human. Mm. So we're learning a lot about muscle physiology from these people. So it kind of works both ways. I learn a lot and they get something out of it too. Okay, real fast, what's the craziest thing you ever uh, did in the lab that you saw that, okay, this is out of control? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be honest us, now. Any, any athlete, you're on whatever. the couch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have to say um, the first time we did the fiber typing and we yep. started to figure out what percentage of fiber types these guys have. And when we started realizing they're way off the charts. Yep. And so we did it again and again. I'm going to come by. I'm going yeah. to donate some fibers. I want to see what's going We'd love on. To see it. Ah. Please, that would explain so much. <laughs> yeah, that would Please explain. do some research. That's the brain. Any excuse to take a needle into his leg, I'll take it. Inside MMA, live every Friday night on XSTV, your home for MMA.